On one dim, dark night in Scotland, an old Highland man was slowly walking through the dense woodland. He had hoped to arrive home before the night fell, but had been waylaid in a local pub. Now drunk and tired, the man stumbled through the woods, wishing there was an easier way, when suddenly he spotted a large black horse drinking from the river. It was as if the very forest itself had answered his wishes. The man hurried to the horse and noticed it had a very placid mood. This was not a wild horse, thought the man. Standing on a large rock, the man threw himself onto the horse's back. All of a sudden, the beast leapt into action and bolted along the river bank. The man cried and wailed, but the creature paid no attention. The man tried to jump from his crazed mount, but he was held to the horse with some kind of mystical force. The horse leapt high into the air and landed in the deep river. The water did not slow the creature, and if anything, it gave it speed. The man, now completely submerged, struggling for the air he would never breathe again, knew in his heart that his life had been taken by the dreaded Kelpie. Kelpie is one of Scotland's most famous creatures of folklore. It is known to be a powerful water spirit and has been mentioned in many tales and stories all throughout Scottish history. In modern times, it's commonly referred to as the water horse due to its connection with the rivers, lochs and burns that it calls its home. Kelpies are a form of shapeshifter. They commonly appear as large black horses but can transform themselves into human figures. The appearance of the Kelpie in either form can differ widely. It is said that the creature's appearance tends to reflect the body of water they guard. For example, the Kelpie spirit of the River Spey was thought to be a great white horse which lured its victims through song. The Kelpie being a spirit of water was said to have an unnatural connection to all bodies of water and especially its own river. There are tales of travellers being washed away by sudden floods while crossing rivers. These floods were thought to have been summoned by the Kelpie, who did not like uninvited humans entering their river. While an equine form, the mane of a Kelpie is always wet, which would betray its mystical disguise. Another method of telling a Kelpie from a horse was by looking at its hooves. The hooves of a Kelpie were reversed from that of a normal horse and depending on the individual creature, may be the only identifying feature that shows that it is not what it seems. There were occasions when a wild Kelpie would mate with common horses. It is said that the equine offspring of this union could not be drowned and had an unnatural connection with the water. It was thought that these hybrids could be identified by their small ears, which were far shorter than those of a common horse. Kelpies are malevolent and dark creatures. They would try and lure unsuspecting humans to climb upon their back. It is said that once seated atop the Kelpie, there is no force on earth which would allow the victim to dismount. The water horse would then drag its cat beneath the cold, dark water, where it would consume them. From time to time, people would stumble across human entrails spread across the banks of a river or loch. This was a sign that the water was protected by a Kelpie. There are even some tales that suggest the Kelpie could extend its back to accommodate many riders. But this is only one half of the Kelpie's devious nature. As I said before, the Kelpie has the ability to take on the appearance of a human figure. Sometimes the Kelpie would appear as a wizened old man in a dark green robe a colour which has a deep connection with the fairies of Scottish legend, called the Doinishi. The Kelpie man would be found relaxing by a river or fishing on a bridge. It would ask passers-by for aid, and when they were close enough to the river, it would leap upon them and drown them. Some say that the Kelpie would take the form of a handsome young man and manipulate the young girls of the village, usually leading to their doom. The most famous depiction of the Kelpie's human form is that of a beautiful young woman washing in the river or loch. 
Through her otherworldly aura and beauty, she would lure passing men into the water and take their lives. Although the famous depiction of Kelpies is that of a female, in Scottish folklore, tales of male Kelpies seem to be far more prevalent. Like the equine form of the Kelpie, the human form had traits that would betray its true nature. A common trait was that the human Kelpie would always have damp hair. Another was having seaweed or algae entwined within the hair. These malicious water spirits have plagued Scotland for many hundreds of years and have taken many lives. But it is said that if you are strong enough and reckless enough, these horrifying creatures can be dominated or even killed. It was thought that the Kelpie's power was held within its bridle. Many of the Kelpies in equine form were fitted with a bridle and saddle, and when they transformed, this bridle would become a silver necklace. Removing this necklace would force the Kelpie back into its horse form and grant you mastery over the beast. There are tales of captured Kelpies being put to work carrying stones or ploughing fields. They were said to have the strength of ten average horses and would never tire in their work. The bridle of the Kelpie was endowed with strong magical powers. Some say it had the ability to transform a person into a horse. Others suggest that it acted as a protective charm, providing the owner safety from black magics and other evil creatures. There were different methods used to destroy a troublesome Kelpie throughout the years. Originally, it was said that iron weapons were the only thing that would harm the beast. It is a well-known fact that the old spirits of the fairy realm could be harmed by iron. Later in history, the methods would change with the introduction of Christianity into Scotland. To control a Kelpie, a bridle would be created and stamped with the mark of the cross. Placing this bridle on a wild Kelpie would force the creature to obey your will. You could rid yourself of this creature by destroying the bridle, as it was said to exorcise the spirit. It was also around this time that the concept of dark creatures being killed by the use of silver was introduced. Silver blades, and on some occasions silver bullets, were therefore the best method of killing a Kelpie. There are hundreds of tales and stories of Kelpies from all over Scotland. It's hard to know where to start from, so I will cover a few short tales I personally find interesting, and may do a separate video in the future on some of the longer and more in-depth stories. The first tale I would like to cover is the White Horse of Spey. The River Spey possesses immense power. It is unpredictable and very dangerous. Over hundreds of years, the Spey has flooded and wrought destruction on life and property all around its vast catchment area. It is said by the locals that those unfortunate enough who fall into the raging river never return. This led to an old saying in the area, the Spey demands one life a year. Among the folk of Speyside, it was thought that the ill temper of the river and the loss of life was due to a dark water spirit bent on destruction. Some even reported seeing a beautiful white horse by the banks of the river. But it was only seen during the most foul of storms. One night, a Murray merchant by the name of Malcolm was travelling through a terrible storm. He was heading for the coastal town of Bucky, but to get there, he had to pass the spay. When he reached the riverbank, his heart sunk. It would seem that the storm had fueled the river to such an extent the bridge had been swept away. Malcolm was tired, hungry and soaked. He was too far from home to head back. Disheartened, the merchant was about to give up when he saw the magnificent white form of a horse rise from the water. Greetings, friend, said the horse. I see the bridge is out, and it would be a shame to turn around now, since you have travelled so far. How about you climb up on my back, and I will ferry you to the other bank? Malcolm was suspicious of the creature. He had heard tales of Kelpies before, and knew this horse to be a spirit. What assurance can you give me that you are not an evil spirit? called the man. I am a spirit, said the horse. Evil or good is not my place to decide. I will tell you, I am no Kelpie. I am a simple water horse. 
As the rain continued to pour, the merchants sat, lost in thought. The Kelpies he had heard of were always black of colour, and the weather was not getting any better, so with some trepidation, the man agreed to the horse's aid. The great white horse came ashore and now stood at its full height. Malcolm climbed upon the horse's back, but the very second he sat in the saddle, the horse took off at breakneck speed. The man screamed and yelled, but the horse took no heed and continued galloping along the bank. The panic rider quickly tried to throw himself from the horse, but found that he was stuck fast by some mysterious power. It was then when the horse let out a terrifying and hideous laughter. The man had been tricked. The white kelpie leapt into the raging spay, and the merchant was never seen again. It was said in Speyside that the white horse claimed innumerable victims in this fashion throughout the years. Kelpies in general did not seem to discriminate in their prey. One tale tells of a group of children and their interaction with this dark water spirit. Somewhere in the western region of the Highlands, on a particularly dreary day, a group of eight or nine children were playing by the side of a river, when suddenly they spotted a large black horse standing by the bank of the river. Filled with curiosity, the children approached the horse they saw that this creature looked beautiful. It had a finely groomed mane and a sleek, glossy black coat. Upon its head, there was a magnificent bridle of gilded leather adorned with jewels of many colours. The children thought that this horse must belong to a passing nobleman, as they had never seen such a creature. The most curious, or possibly the most foolhardy child, stepped closer to the great horse and began to stroke its long soft mane. But suddenly there was a terrible shriek. The child's hand was stuck fast to the horse and try as he might, there was no way to remove it. At hearing the young boy scream, the other children raced to his aid. But strangely, the horse didn't seem to notice the children or the shouting and continued to graze quietly by the bank. The other children tried to free their trapped companion but as each of them tried to move the boy or the great horse, they too became stuck. The last boy to try and help was a little older than the rest, and figured touching the horse was not a good idea. So one at a time, he tried to pull the now crying children away from their equine captor. Finally, the boy decided if he could lead the horse back to the village, he could find someone to help. Being wary not to touch the horse's hide, the boy grasped the bridle, and to his horror, his hand became stuck. Before the boy had time to think, the horse suddenly bolted, with all speed, heading for the river, with the now terrified children being dragged along with it. The older boy, almost without thinking, drew his fishing knife and severed his fingers from the hand that held the bridle. Falling to the ground in excruciating pain, he looked up just in time to see his friends dragged screaming under the water. With his remaining strength, the boy ran back to the village and told this very tale to the heartbroken parents. From that day on, the fingerless boy would never again approach a lone horse by the waterside. I think these two tales show the cruelty of the Scottish Kelpie and how it was not a creature to be underestimated, but how did it act while in human form? Many years ago, there was a young Highland woman named Mary, who lived with her father in a small village. During the summer months, many of the villagers would travel up into the hills to allow their cattle new pastures. Mary's father was old, and it was difficult for him to make his journey up into the hills. So for the last few years, the young woman would go alone. While there, she would live in a small shaling and spend her nights spinning yarn. In fact, it was on one of these nights when Mary sat spinning that she heard footsteps heading towards the shaling door. As the steps came to a halt, a strange voice spoke. Mary, may I enter? She assumed it was one of the other villagers. Perhaps they required aid with their cattle. Of course, she called. Come in and sit by the fire. The door opened and to her surprise, it was a young man, unknown to her. He stepped through the door and sat beside the fire. He said he was a traveller and he had been fishing in the river nearby. 
and wondered if she would like to eat a meal with him. Quite smitten by the handsome young man, Mari was almost lost for words. Eventually, she agreed, and the man produced two trout which they cooked on the fire. As the enthralling man was about to take his leave, Mari questioned him, How was it that you knew my name? Quite simple, said the man. I asked some of the other villagers who the most beautiful woman in the village was, and I was told it was a young woman by the name of Mari. Then I saw you this afternoon tending your cattle, and I knew for certain Mari was your name. The young woman was once again lost for words. She had never before felt this way. She wondered if she loved this strange man. He asked if he could return on the next evening and promised to bring more fish. Mari agreed and the man walked off into the night. True to his word, the man returned the next day and the night after that and the following night. Each time, the young woman felt more enraptured by his charm. Yet at the same time, she thought there was a strange aura about the man. Something in his mannerisms and appearance that she could not quite put her finger on. So early one morning, Marie took the long journey from the hills to the village, and there she told her father of the strange man and his odd nature. Her father was quite disturbed by his daughter's tale. He had lived in the land for a long time, and had heard tales of handsome strangers in the hills before, and more often than not, the focus of their attention would disappear, never to be seen again. The father asked his daughter to stay in the village, and that he would go to the Shalin, but first he would consult a local wise woman. With all haste, he left the house and headed to a small hut on the village outskirts. There he regaled the wise woman of Mary's odd encounter. It would seem that your daughter has met the Kelpie of the waterfall, said the wise woman. She told the man that a Kelpie had always lived in the pool at the base of a waterfall in the hills. And it is he who abducts the young woman of the village and has done so for many generations. But all is not lost, said the woman. The Kelpie fears boiling water. What you must do is cast a pot of boiling water over the beast and it will reveal his true form. Thankful for the advice, the father then made the long journey to the Shalin on the hill. Darkness was falling when he arrived and although the old man was incredibly weary and sore, he set about boiling the water. He then donned the dress of his daughter and sat disguised by the spinning wheel. As he had on many other nights, the strange man entered the Shalin and sat by the fire. Good evening, my beloved, he said to the person at the wheel. There was no reply. The visitor threw a pile of sticks on the fire and the room filled with light. With the mere hint of a grey beard beneath the cowl of the figure at the wheel, the visitor knew he had been tricked and suddenly leapt towards the father in a menacing fashion. But the old Scotsman was prepared and threw the pot of scalding water across the feet of the stranger. Immediately, his human feet morphed into large black hooves. The beast ran for the door and the father gave chase, but by the time he had reached the door, all he could see was a large black horse galloping off into the distance. A few days later, Mari returned to the Shalin to continue tending the cattle, and from that day on, she was never troubled by the Kelpie of the waterfall. Some have said that this Kelpie still haunts the waterfall and can be identified by the burns on its hind legs. The origin of the Scots word Kelpie is uncertain. It's thought that there may be a connection with the Gaelic words Kalpa or Kalpach, meaning heifer or colt. The earliest known reference to the word can be traced to a dictionary of the older Scottish tongue transcribed by M. B. Johnson and C. M. Armit between 1576 and 1604. The word may very well have been in common use far before it was written down. Some suggest that the Kelpie or a water horse type creature was represented in the Pictish stones. The Pictish stones are one of the oldest and only known artifacts of the Pictish people. Most of these old stones date from the 6th to the 9th century and were found in northeast Scotland or Old Pictland. 
experts have suggested that these stones and their mysterious carvings show an insular tradition, which has no parallels with the rest of the British Isles. Perhaps then, the modern Kelpie can be traced back to the Pictish horse carvings on these archaic stones. A similar concept of the Kelpie's origin is that the water horse dates to a time when villagers would appease the water gods or spirits in the form of human sacrifice, and over time, these water gods became the malevolent Kelpie. The association with horses may be linked to early Norse or Irish traditions, in which horses were sacrificed to appease the gods. The idea of a vengeful equine spirit may be related to these practices. The concept of shape-shifting water spirits seems to be quite widespread in the world's mythology. There are parallels to the Germanic Nixie, which is also found in Scandinavian folklore, where it is said to take the form of a horse and is referred to as the Brook Horse. In Australia, there is the Bunyip, an evil spirit from Aboriginal beliefs. Similar to the Kelpie, the Bunyip is said to be found in rivers, swamps and lakes. It waits patiently to attack any human intruders to its home. In Wales, there is a water horse named the Kefildur. It dwells in mountain pools and waterfalls and has the ability to shapeshift. It is said that this beast would leap out of the water and would trample lone travellers or passers-by. Even in Scotland, there are other creatures of folklore which mirror aspects of the Kelpie. There's a creature known as the Yahushka, which means water horse in Gaelic. These creatures are often mistaken for Kelpies, but it is said that they are far more violent and ferocious, and more commonly found in salt water. Some have suggested that the Kelpie may be the Scots equivalent of the Gaelic water horse, since the Yahushka is more commonly found in the west coast of Scotland and in Ireland. There are also water bulls, but they may be a tale for another time. The general consensus when dealing with dangerous water spirits is that they exist in tales and folklore to discourage young children from playing near rivers and lochs. Tales of the Kelpie also stand as a warning about approaching horses or animals. Many a child through the years has been accidentally killed by spooking or surprising a grazing horse. The tale of Mari and the Kelpie from the waterfall is one of many where a Kelpie will disguise itself as an attractive young man and lure young women to their untimely death. This stands as a warning to young women not to trust handsome male strangers. These stories also appear frequently during the increase of Christianity in Scotland. In many of the newer tales, a young lady will be saved from the amorous Kelpie by holding a cross or Bible. Before we reach the end, I want to bring up what I think to be an important controversy when dealing with the Kelpie. Many old Scottish books of folklore and many experts in the field seem to strongly disagree on whether or not the Kelpie and the water horse are the same creature or two different entities entirely. Renowned researcher of Scottish folklore, John Grigerson Campbell, suggests that the Kelpie is not represented in any Gallic superstition or folklore, whereas the water horse is. The water horse, according to Campbell, is a peaceful water spirit and is not known to harm humans. Some suggest that the water horse lives in lochs and the Kelpie can only be found in fast flowing water. Yet folklore researcher Catherine Briggs retells a story of an evil Kelpie that lives in a loch near Perthshire. In the north of Scotland, there are tales of the Kelpie, where it appears as a large reptilian beast and is totally separate from the peaceful water horse. In fact, in some tales, the Kelpie is referred to as an evil spirit that appears in the beastly form of a furred human and has little to no connection to the water. Misinterpretation and mistranslation between Old Scots, Gaelic and English may also be to blame for this confusion, since the name for a Gallic water horse is Yahushka, which although it is a water spirit similar to the Kelpie, is actually neither a Kelpie nor what Campbell would call a common water horse. 
Perhaps some of the nuance between these mythological creatures has just been lost time. I can say, as someone who has lived in Scotland all my life, that I have always known the Kelpie as Scotland's malevolent water horse. I hope you have made it this far and enjoyed the video. Before you leave, I would like to tell you that I have been working with a few really amazing artists to come up with a few t-shirt designs. If you would like to buy a t-shirt and support the channel, I will leave a link in the description where there is currently 15% off all orders for the next two weeks. Once again, thank you all for the support and thank you for listening.